You're listening to Cooper Talk. Oh, welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. I got to tell you something, people. So I decided to cancel my trip to Seattle because it is coronavirus central. And I was called Orbitz yesterday to call my flight. I was on hold for over an hour. So then I finally get through the guy, and I tell him I have flight insurance. And he says, well, American Airlines, I can rebook for $200. And I said, but I have flight insurance. He kept going back and forth. 20 minutes later, I've been put on hold three more times. He says to me, you have to call the flight insurance people. I was so frustrated. Anyway, we have a great show today. Uh, my guest, I know my guest is about to go on vacation. And he's a wonderful singer uh, from the band Glass Tiger. Uh, my friend Paul Guerrero used to take a lot of photographs of him. And I know hit him up, then told me to hit him up, and it all happened. And my guest is Alan Frew. How you doing, Alan? I'm good, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well. So now you're, you're going on vacation, right? I am. I'm going to the Turks and Caicos. Now, what made you pick that besides it being beautiful? Uh, it's really beautiful. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's very quiet, uh, beautiful weather, need a little pampering, been working very hard, and, uh, and, and sort of deserve it. <laughs> Well, the last 12 months, I follow you on Facebook, has been, you've been really busy. What's been going on in the last 12 months? Well, the Tigers, um, you know, there's been a, a little bit of a resurgence. Um, you know, we've no grand illusions that, uh, you know, you're back in the mainstream again. We, we know we're an 80s band. We know it's retro. We know it's nostalgia. But, um, but we, you know, we, we've always remained very, very busy. In Canada, it's no problem for Glass Tiger to, um, you know, to a coast to coast in Canada. But there's been a little resurgence that's allowed us to sort of dip our toe in the water again. We've we've done a few, uh, a couple of little uh, U.S. dates. We did the U.K. We did a, a really big festival over in Poland, and we're sort of getting reinvited again. So. You know, we're, we're, we're going to dabble again this year in the States. Um, we're going to Scotland, actually. We're going to do a show in Scotland and uh, another couple in the UK. And then we're going to Germany. Now, plus, plus all the usual Canadian stuff. Now, you're originally from Scotland, right? I, I, I am. Now, now, what kind of music did you listen to as a kid? Well, I was uh, totally immersed in the Beatles. They were... They were everything to me uh, that a band should be. Uh, and then on the peripheral, you know, bands like uh, Paul Rogers and Free, uh, David Bowie, uh, a little bit of Zeppelin, The Who, The Rolling Stones. It was, it was a very British uh, thing. Uh, I didn't really uh, catch on to US bands until I moved, moved over to Canada. Now, when you were in Scotland, did you start singing at a young age, or did you catch the fever to be a musician in Ontario? Well, I always, you know, I always knew that I had the ability to entertain. Like, I, I'd be the one that would get up in front of the class uh, and, and sing a song. I would be the one that put uh, an air band, air band together with no guitars, and we'd all get up in front of the class and pretend we were the Beatles. Um, I would entertain my, my, my father was uh, a cl sort of closet entertainer uh, at home for all the kids and for family and friends. He would put on little shows and stuff. So I, I came by honestly. And then, of course, in Scotland, especially in those days, there was so many characters, you know, in, in the pubs and coming to your home. Uh, people would be willing to get up and sing. So I... I knew I could do that, but I had no real uh, desire to join a band. It really was sort of forced on. It came and found me in the late, in the mid to late seventies. Uh, then that imploded, and I um, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, so I got into the medical field and started. Uh, I, I became I eventually became a, a registered nurse, uh, and I wanted to work in the OR in the operating room. I assisted in autopsies <laughs> for, <laughs> for four years, and, uh, and then a band found me again. 
Now, how did you find, well, I know originally your band was called uh, Tokyo, right? Yeah, well, originally I was in one band in the late, the mid to late 70s called Onyx, and that's where I really kind of cut my teeth at being the uh, front man of a band. And then, uh, and then I, I, you know, there was that little gap, and then um, a band called uh, Tokyo uh, were, was put together, and I was the front man in that band. And that band became... Now, you said you cut your teeth as a frontman in that first band. How does one cut yeah. their teeth as a frontman? Because it's such a, uh, you know, the frontman has so much power, and you're you're the face of the group a lot of times. How do you learn? How, do, how did you cut your teeth? Well, it, it, like anything else, you know, like, okay, so the, the, they had me, someone had me singing. I, I'd learned a few chords on the guitar, and I, I formed that uh a, a duo with a, a buddy and we sang at parties and, and stuff like that and so someone in a rock band a local rock band had heard me singing so they all landed on my front door one night begging me to come to an audition and I was like oh you know I just wanted rid of them <laughs> so I said <laughs> okay could go and I'll be there of course I had no car they came and picked me up some one guy in the band of the car, and uh, so we went to the audition, and they asked me what did, what did I know, and I said, well, I know the Beatles, so anything by the Beatles. So we started playing Get Back by the Beatles, and I could see in my peripheral vision that they were like, oh man, this guy's, you know, gotta get him kind of thing. And so they asked me after rehearsal if I'd join the band, and the, their poor lead singer was told there was no there was no rehearsal that night, and so little did he little did he know he was out of job, and uh, and I said, well, okay. So I cut my teeth means that, you know, it, it was one thing to learn the songs, but it's another thing to get up there in front of band, and and so I, you know, I'm I'm using, you know, cut my teeth as a sort of metaphor, but you know, you kind of learn how to become. It, it, there's, there was no fear in singing to people, but it was always like, what am I going to say to them? How's my body language going to be when I'm up there? Am I just going to stand straight up stiff like a board? Or am I going to move to the right and the left? And I, so it, you kind of have to sort of cut your teeth at that. It, you know, it becomes a, a, a part of the, 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 the routine. And, and then eventually, you, you know, you start getting very comfortable with it. You start expressing yourself as you're going for those big notes. And and, and there you go. You, you become a front man. So you're the front man, and then, you know, you leave that band and you join Tokyo, which becomes Glass Tiger. How do you guys start booking gigs? What was the music scene like in your area at that time? Well, I'm, I'm sure it was the same um, all over the States. Uh and probably the UK and maybe even in Europe at the time. In in the the seventies going into the eighties, the bar scene was vibrant. There were bars everywhere that had live music, and so you know, talking your way into a bar, getting a hold of an owner and saying we're a really good band, you should give us a chance. That was one way, and then of course you know you could find local agents who may come to a rehearsal and see you and say, okay, I'll, I'll book your band. And then eventually, uh, in the bar scene, a, a manager or two may stroll through the door because they've heard about you. So in, in our day, the, the bar scene was extremely vibrant. And uh, the only thing that was kind of, it makes me chuckle when I look back on it, is the bar owners wanted nothing to do with uh, original music. All they wanted were covers. They wanted you to play Zeppelin and the Beatles and, you know, whoever else had made it before you, you know, Tears for Fears or U2 or whatever. And, uh, and so we, we were extremely good cover band. Um, uh, you know, uh, mostly UK stuff for obvious reasons. And, uh, once we started filling the bars, you know, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they started to fill up. By Thursday, Friday, when they were jammed, 
we would start to sneak some original material in and we just put a fake a fictitious name to it you know here's a here, here's a band from the uk called thin red line and we play we play an original song and of course as long as he or she were selling tons of booze they they turned off they didn't care and so then we started sneaking more and more original music in and the bars would still be full so all of a sudden managers and and agents and then eventually record companies started to come watch you now what was your what was your writing process back then uh pretty much the same well maybe in the early days there was more tendency for us all to be in the room at the same time and you're having a rehearsal which was really a writing rehearsal and someone would fire up an idea and I would stand on a microphone and I would emote uh, ideas and it was it was really a rehearsal writing session but very quickly it developed into sort of little teams that would split up kind of thing where they would kind of either put an idea on a cassette and give it to me and I would work on it at home and come back or possibly I would go up to, uh, in Glass Tiger's case, the keyboard player Sam Reed and I, we spent countless hours together at his place uh, writing and then bringing it to the band. So, you know, you're starting to, you're getting, you're playing your original music at the bars in Canada. You said record people started coming in and seeing you. How do you get approached? When do you get that first deal? Uh, ours was incredibly, um, there was a very interesting twist to ours. Um, you know, we, we, we were kind of being scouted by all of them. You'd look out, you know, your manager would come and say, you know, Warner's is here. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Sony's here, and so you go out and you know do your thing. But but uh, Capitol Records started coming around a lot, and uh, and eventually they had us, um, and they had the the ability. It used to be in Canada, you perf- you performed for a Canadian record company, and then if they liked you, they signed you. And then they would invite the sister uh, companies from America and the Americans would come. And then if they liked you, they would, they would re-sign you, um, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, an American deal. And, um, so in, in, in our case, Capital had the ability, they had done a deal, um, I guess with the, the mother company in the UK. And they were looking for a band to sign internationally, like right out of Canada. And uh, uh, they had us. They scouted us. They loved us. And so uh, one day I got a phone call to go down to Capitol Records, thinking this was it. You know, we're going down. Uh, after all this hard work, we're going to sign this big deal. And when I got there, <laughs> uh, the two, our two managers were there. And no other guys in the band, and I was like, "Where, where are the boys?" And nobody was really saying anything. <laughs> and then, uh, and then the second in command came in, and he sort of said, "So, did you tell him?" <laughs> and and uh, nobody was saying anything. And and I thought, "Oh, that they're not going to sign us. They're here to tell me that they've changed okay. their mind." And then the the top guy came in and said the same thing, well, does he know? And I said, this is crazy, know what? And he said, well, here's the deal, Uh, we've changed our mind, we're signing you, we're sending you to England, and uh, we're gonna match you up with this guy, David Bendis, and uh, we're gonna make you a star. And I'm thinking, well, what about the band? And it was like, well, you can keep one of them, and I've, I've always forgotten what, but it wasn't the rhythm section, I'll tell you that. <laughs> because this this, uh, this uh, record guy had, had uh, actually a reputation for for breaking up rhythm sections. He was a, a, an ex-drummer. And, and I thought, well, this is insane. So I said to him, you know, can I think about it? And then he, he thought that was insane. 
And he goes, think about it. You know, they offered me a, 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 a signing on bonus, which at the time would have seemed like a million dollars. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to go home and think about it. And he thought that was crazy. And then I turned it down. Because I knew the band, I knew we were great. And so then he lost his mind and said, you know, who does that little Scottish prick think he is? He'll, he'll, he'll never work in this town again kind of thing. And so we went back to the drawing board. We had no record deal. We started in the bars. And then Island Records came along. And uh, a guy here in Toronto called Doug Chappelle, and he wooed us and he got us. And we were about to sign when uh, Chris Blackwell, uh, for, your, for your listening audience, please Google Chris Blackwell. He's a legend. He's a legend that created Island Records out of the trunk of his car. And he signed Bob Marley, and and he he signed you too to Island Records. And early early Glass Tiger and the early U2 were quite similar. So at the last minute, he decided he wanted to fly into Canada and see us. So the legend himself came into a local bar, saw the band, it was jammed to the rafters. And meanwhile, all the other record companies are there, including Capitol Records. <laughs> And, and Dean from Capitol Records, like uh, I always say, like putting out breadcrumbs for sparrows, Dean used to put pints of Guinness <laughs> <laughs> on the table because he knew I would come around like a little hummingbird. <laughs> hey, Dean. Hey, Alan. How you doing? Not bad. Uh, you know, and then I would have a pint of Guinness. So. And so anyway, Chris Blackwell shook my hand after the, the show, and I knew in my heart that he wasn't going to sign the band. Not, not because we weren't great, but because, hey, the guy hit you too. And uh, so, sure enough, he passed, which broke the heart of the gentleman here in Toronto. And so our Canadian managers had made a really smart move. They, 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 they brought this uh, U.S. manager on board, a guy by the name of Derek Sutton, who was the manager of Styx, and he, he'd taken Styx right to the top. And he came and saw us and fell in love with us. And he got us uh, uh, an opening slot with Boy George and Culture Club at the famous Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. 20,000 people. And I was on the midnight shift at the hospital doing seven nights as an orderly at the hospital. And uh, so I was working like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, midnight to... 8 a.m. Friday, I got up at 8 a.m. in the morning, went down to Toronto, I lived outside of Toronto at the time, got on stage, opened up for Boy George, in front of 20,000 people, got a pat in the back, went back up to, the, to Newmarket, and I was slinging bedpans on the midnight shift. <laughs> I got up at 8 o'clock on the Saturday morning, go down to Toronto, play pop star that night, opening up for Boy George, back up to a little town called Newmarket, slinging bedpans on a Saturday night. I do the same on a Sunday, and on a Monday, I'm exhausted from my seven night straight and playing rock star. And my mother comes into the bedroom and she says, there's a, a phone call for you. And I said, tell me, piss off, I'm too tired. <laughs> she said, no, it sounds, it sounds really, really uh, uh, important. So I go on the phone, and this voice says, you're a star. And I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> he said, you're a, you're a star. I said, who is this? He said, it's Tim, Tim Trombley, who was the, the second in command. He said, Dean is on the line. And Dean was the one who said, who does this Scottish prick think he is? He'll never work in this town again. <laughs> and I said, hello, Dean. He goes, hey, Alan. And the, and the two of them had been at Maple Leaf Gardens. And Dean said, and I quote, well, I guess if I want the cherries, I'll have to take the whole fucking pie. <laughs> and he said, he said, come on, come on down. And we went down as a band, and we signed an international record deal. Now, Capital Records. Now, you signed a deal, you start going into a uh, record, and um, how does Jim Valance get involved? Well, Dean, uh, I promised Dean that if he signed the band intact and he felt that 
you know, we couldn't cut it in any way that we'd be willing to work with them. You know, they could bring in seasoned people. And, uh, and he did. And he brought, he brought some other people in to work with the guys. Uh, and then, in his mighty wisdom, he, he'd heard that Jim Valens wanted to branch out as a producer. And he thought the Valens was a perfect match. And so Valens flew into Toronto and came up to the little town of Newmarket. And we spent a couple of days with him. And then Valens said, and for your listeners, actually, Jim Valens is the songwriting partner for Brian Adams. Anybody who loves the classic Brian Adams stuff, that's all Jim and Brian together. And so uh, he invited myself and uh, Sam and Al Conley out to Vancouver. And on the very first day we ever worked with him, he picked us up at the airport and driving into his place, he asked us who we were listening to, what bands were we listening to these days. And we mentioned a few, and two that I remember, one was Jesus Jones, and the other one was, uh, um, oh, we told him Simple Minds, and we told him Tears for Fears uh, songs from the big chair. And so we grabbed, he stopped at a record store and he grabbed albums, vinyl, on these bands, and we went to his place and we were sitting over a cup of tea listening to music when suddenly um, Everybody Wants to Rule the World came on. And Valence went, oh, shuffle beat. And he immediately started a shuffle beat. And again, for the audience, it's So he started doing a shuffle beat, which made Al Conley do this little ding da ding ding da ding da ding ding And I immediately went, don't forget me when I'm gone. But I sang it as a verse. So Valence went, oh, that's really, and this is where the experience comes in. Valence went, what a cool line, man. Take that, let's leave that over here. And he move it to the side. And so we worked and worked on, and I went, you take my breath away. And then later on, he said, bring that line back. And I went, don't forget me when I'm gone. And he went, killer line. And, it, and that's a chorus. And then, and this is all in the first day, then Al Conley and Sam Reed, they were smokers at the time. And Jim and I were, you know, avid non-smokers. So you had to leave, not only leave the, the, the house, you had to leave the vicinity. <laughs> so, so the guys went for a walk. They went for a walk down the street. And uh, it left me alone with Valens. And Valens got on the keyboards and he did this little chugga chugga thing. Chugga chugga chin, chugga 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 chin. And I immediately went, when I come home, you telephone. And then I just went, when I come home. And Valens went, love that. And when the boys come back, we, we worked on that. And on the very first day, we wrote, don't forget me when I'm gone. And someday, our two biggest hits of all time. That's amazing. Now, once you get, once you get those two songs in your pocket and you're working on the album, when does the album? When do you start getting airplay? What was the process? Well, the process was that again, uh, just like the bar scene, the radio scene was incredibly vibrant. You had at any given time, you had six or seven local big city radio stations that were all playing pop music. You know, you got, in those days, like, a, 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 here in Toronto, there was, like, <laughs> one station, Q107, that was playing rock, and the rest were all playing pop. So it was an incredibly vibrant scene. So when the record company believed in you and they signed you to a major deal, it was a big deal. I mean, Capitol Records sunk probably the better part of half a million to a million dollars in is. And, uh, you know, you, you were making a world-class album. Uh, we recorded at the studio in Morton Heights uh, where the police did synchronicity and, you know, just legend, Rush did all their albums there. And so money was no object kind of a thing. 
I did all the vocals in Vancouver at Jim's place. And so when, when the time comes to launch a single with a major label behind it, you had the vibrancy of uh, radio stations. And then, of course, you had video stations. You had MTV. You had much music. Uh, you had all these. You had Here in Toronto, you had video hits. You had Good Rockin' Tonight. So when Don't Forget Me When I'm Gone was launched, it was just a massive feeding frenzy of radio and television. And then that was that. Now, do you remember you the... Don't, you don't have that now. Oh, yeah, I know. It's crazy. I love them TV. I remember your videos. And I remember that hat you wore on Sunday. Um, <laughs> now, when you do you remember the first time you heard Don't Forget Me When I'm Gone on the radio? Yes. Yes, we were told... Uh, this was this sort of become uh, folklore up here. I've told this story in many a radio station, but um, uh, we were told that it was launching on, you know, pick a date, like Friday the 14th of May or whatever it was, that the radio stations were told that they could not play it until 5 p.m. Don't ask me why, but that's what they were all told by the record company. You can't play till 5 o'clock. So because we knew it was going to, they were going to do that, uh, my family, we had like six different little transistor radios and we had an old stereo that had a radio in it and we had them tuned to, to like six different stations. Uh, and sure enough, at 10 to 5 or 5 minutes to 5, one of the radio stations decided, fuck it, we're going we're, we're gonna to get a jump on it. <laughs> and and they they launch it, and you hear the first one, ba 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 da da, and you you go, Dad, Dad, it is, <laughs> and we can hear. Don't forget. Well, of course, the next radio station knows that the first one's doing that, so at four minutes to they launch, and then three minutes to, and it just became a a cacophony of you know bedlam in our living room. But we were going, we were going crazy hearing it. You know, my mum and dad and and my family and everybody gathered around all these little radios and then the phone rings and it's the manager saying you've just sold 6,000 copies of the single you know because now the the record stores there were all kinds of record stores they were and the big one here in Toronto was Sam the record man and they just bought 6,000 copies and then he would call back and he would say it's 15,000. <laughs> and, you know, we, of course, the single alone goes on to sell 100,000 plus copies. And uh, it becomes the fastest selling single at the time in Canadian history and the fastest selling album that went gold in like a couple of days. It goes on to do like five times platinum or six times. It's probably diamond now here in Canada, but they, they stopped counting a long time ago. And, uh, and it was just a, just a, a marvelous, uh, uh, innocent, you know, naivety. It was just brilliant. Now, when did you quit your nursing job? Well, I held the nursing job down right to the, just to the point where I became an RN, a fully qualified RN. I was what they call a charge nurse. I, I was sort of in charge of the medications and all those things that that uh, you know carried a lot of stress with it and this but I was you know I was a single parent I was uh, still performing in the bars I was killing myself and my staff had started to notice changes in my behavior and so I get sort of called into the the administrator who said, you know, Alan, you know, you've been here for years, we love you, we would never fire you. But but, you know, the staff's beginning to notice that you're 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 like a zombie. And uh, I'm asking you to take a leave of absence and uh, um, uh, you know, and come back to us if it doesn't work. And that was right about the time when Capital were getting very serious trying to, you know, nail us down. And, uh, and so I quit the hospital and, you know, the scenario I just gave you, the, 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 the bar scene and then going, meeting violence 
and writing don't forget me when I'm gone and, and knowing all well, that's it you know you're, you're not going back so the song starts taking off you guys are becoming big and of course with the help of MTV because you were all you were all dressed nice you were good looking guys and MTV could make someone and they were helping you now, what happens to you then? How do you start touring? I know you toured with Tina Turner, but what what was your first tour as that song well, started becoming well, the, big? The, the first major tour was the fact that Journey, Steve Perry and Journey, were looking for an opening act. And uh, they, they kind of got very involved in who that opening act was going to be. And they fell in love with Someday. Steve, loved, Steve and Neil loved Someday. And so they chose Glass Tiger, and so our first major tour was raised on radio uh, with Journey all across America. It was unbelievable. Now, what was that like? You know, your your guys who were playing in bars. Now you're playing with Journey, one of the biggest bands. Were you nervous when you go on stage in front of all those people? Well, I, you know, going back to cutting your teeth and becoming a front man. I mean, but this time, I was well seasoned in terms of getting out there and doing it. So the nerves would be the it would be that that sort of passionate uh, nervousness that any great athlete would experience. You're nervous, but you want to get out there and 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 show them what you can do. And so it wasn't a fearful thing; it was a, a pleasurable thing. Uh, and so we we went out there and. And we watched our audience grow right before our eyes because it went from no one knows us to, uh, you know, MTV and don't forget me when I'm gone, climbing the charts. And so we started to notice more uh, Glass Tiger t-shirts, uh, more Glass Tiger cheering, and then people who were Journey fans were digging Glass Tiger and loving both bands. And... Uh, you know, it was just a marvelous tour. Now, how is your life changing? Because I'm sure people are recognizing you. You are a, a rock star. What is it like? Because I know you were a little, you weren't like a 23-year-old punk. You know, you were grounded. You had a job before you left. Right. So you knew, I'm sure you were like sitting there going, you know, I've been working for this, not overnight success. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, you know, the, the, the hysteria of it um, wore off on me fairly quickly. I was already a, a, a parent of a, of a nine-year-old at the time. The predominant fan base were teenage females. So for me, there was, a, there was that sort of parental connection. You know, I had a little boy at home. And these little girls were sort of screaming at me. So uh, that part of it, you know, wore off you know, fairly quickly. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a, a very funny moment where I'm getting chased. Literally, we're all getting chased towards the tour bus. And I get cut off from the tour bus. And I veer to the right, and I'm running up a street being <laughs> chased by these teenage girls when it dawns on me, what the hell am I doing? And why am I letting this happen? And so I basically stop and turn around and get very loud and say, okay. <laughs> and, and like kids, they stop. And I sort of lecture them. And then like the Pied Piper, I lead them all the way and I tell them if they'll behave themselves, they can get what they want. And I'll lead them all back to the tour bus. And uh, and we line them up one at a time and sign autographs for them, which is what they wanted, and and, uh, and take pictures. And so uh, for me, it was um, it was more about I noticed that you know there's, there's the obvious trimmings that comes with uh, with starved on or whatever you want to call it, where now you've got a full crew and people moving you from A to B. All you have to do is show up, and the next thing you know, you're in Germany, and you know you're you're kind of flying business class, and you're getting treated really well, and your hotels are great, and um, and record executives are you know wooing you, and and uh, you're, you're doing major uh, radio and television, and 
it, you know, it dawns on you that your life has changed pretty drastically. Um, that, that's, that's about it. For us, one of the regrets would be, and I just talked about this yesterday with a young band here in Canada that I'm working with. Um, I, I told them to savour it, to make sure that you take the time to step back and give yourself a pat in the back and and show gratitude, not only to to the outside world, but to yourself. Uh, because we, we never did that. We were, we were working at such a frantic pace. They were always pulling us to another, to another, to another. So by the time we were sort of number one in Canada, we were already in America. And by the time we were climbing the charts of America, we were already in France. And by the time we, were, we left France, we were coming back to do another. T- and it just was like this constant chasing the next thing because the pressure that the record company and management and stuff put upon you. We never really ever had the chance to, I mean, don't get me wrong, we had a ton of fun, and, and, but we never really understood just how big it was <laughs> and, and, and how we were doing it we, because we were constantly doing it. So I, was t- I, would, I would tell young people, I would tell anybody who started their own business that's really starting to, you know, people tell you about, you know, keep going and keep going and work hard and don't stop and, you know, whenever you get extra hours in the day. And I, I agree with all of those things, but you have to find those moments where you step out of it and say, wow, you know, this is great. Look what I have done. I deserve, I deserve to you know, pat myself on the back and say, good job. Well, I hear, I hear that so much because, you know, you're, when you're getting a break, you are so busy. Now, as you guys were blowing up and you're so busy, at what point do you start thinking you have to release a second album? And at what point does a record company say, hey, man, you know what? you got to get a second album out. Well, that's it. I mean, by the time we're on tour with Tina Turner over in Europe, they're asking for a second album already. And meanwhile, you're just breaking your first album in Europe, but they're asking you to think about it. And so we're already uh, in writing mode, and then we come back to Canada. Uh, as a matter of fact, we we got a big contract with Disney, and we played Disney in Florida for a month and a half, and then they shipped us to uh, California for a month and a half. And, and we were doing grad nights for big universities and colleges. And it, in the daytime, uh, we were writing the second album. And on on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, when we weren't really needed, we would fly, Sam and I would fly up to Vancouver and write with Alan's. And, uh, and, and, and that was just what became the second album. <clears throat> Now, the second album went triple platinum in Canada, and it was very huge in Canada. How did it do in the States? Uh, it, it starts to, uh, things start to wane in the States, and not through any fault of the band. Uh, this is where, you know, it's a music business, capital M, small b. One of the, when I take you back to the, the initial story when Capital signed us as an international act, right out of Canada. Much and all as that was a, a, a great thing, it was also very detrimental because what happened was the American label, especially the American label, um, they don't really get allowed to put the money in. Uh, capital are footing the bill for everything, which sounds on paper like a, a good thing for the Americans, but of course it's not. Because what's happening is they're not, they don't have any, uh, uh, any you know, coin in the game. So um, they're, really, they're really only being asked them to distribute. And it starts in the second album, it really starts to take a, a downward spiral because having no, you know, no coin in, in the game at all, they're kind of like, well, if we're not financially invested in it, 
we'll just financially invest over here in this other thing we're working on. And so it starts to wane and uh, it, it had moderate success in the States. But in Canada, it was still, and in Europe, it was still uh, big. And then by then, of course, by the third album, um, that's when the disconnect happens uh, with uh, everywhere else other than Canada. Well, is that frustrating as an artist? Because you know your music's good because it's selling in Canada. I mean, if it was bad music, it wouldn't sell. What goes through your mind as an artist and a songwriter that you know you're churning out great product, but mm -hmm. you're getting sort of the blunt end of the stick, may we say, by besides Canada, everywhere else? Well, I think any young listeners today, anybody who's listening to this podcast that are in the, in the music scene today, this is where today's music scene becomes very much like what you just described. It, it's an incredibly frustrating environment to know that you're putting out great product and no one is getting to hear it. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating as an artist. Now, of course, in my scene, the 90s come along, which was still very vibrant, and it was a whole different different genre. And so we sort of got cut out of that scene, but there still, there still was a scene for Nirvana and Pearl Jam and those guys. It's not until you get into today's sort of scene where now it becomes very frustrating even for great young artists who don't have the ability to get the music heard the way that, you know, that it should be. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a frustrating thing, but as any, any musician will tell you, I mean, I mean, okay, so we were lucky. We, we got out with a legacy and got out, you know, uh, financially well off and able to, to, to stay in, in the Canadian scene. And so we have been a touring act in our own country for years. So you still feel relevant to your fans. As a matter of fact, American fans are the ones uh, that got very frustrated and European fans saying, man, why, do, why don't you guys come play for us? Well, of course, it was very difficult to do that. You can't just, you know, jump in a van and drive to Des Moines, Iowa and do one gig and come home. Those those days are over. And and the frustration of the scene is that, you know, you there, there is not enough of a scene to give you a tour. You now, it's kind of coming back a little bit. The 80s are coming back. And we're going to try, uh, there's a, a thing called uh, the Lost 80s, I think it's called. And we're going to come down to Texas and do four or five shows. And we're going to go to California and do four or five shows. But it's just the hits. It's, we're part of a, a bigger production where we're just going to do the hits. And we're, we're content to do that because we can. So we'll come down and we'll be part of this scene and we'll come out and we'll, we'll do the hits. And hopefully reacquaint with you know, the, the music scene down there and maybe get the opportunity to come to other places. But um, I, I don't know what it would be like being a young artist today. And on the one hand, <clears throat> you, there's nothing, there's nowhere to go. And so you're just writing uh, for the sake of writing and, and, and put, slapping it up on, on socials. But on the other hand, socials can turn around and, and make you a superstar like Billie Eilish. We didn't have that in my day. Uh, you know, you had to get out and, and play. So it's a it's a, a very interesting dichotomy of you know black and white and uh, you know it's uh, it, what works for one doesn't work for the other you know so you know you'll get some young guy today saying this is insane I can't get my music heard at any particular level and then you got Billy Eilish doing the, the James Bond tune and winning Oscars and whatever right so it's crazy now your band you know your last after your last album in 91 you took a hiatus what made you come back to do the album 31 and then you did 33 what made you decide to come back and 
pretty much re I mean reform and start playing new music. Well, uh, see the, what you don't realize is that we were so you get into the nineties and uh, if you want to call it a breakup, you could call it that. And I go ahead and do a couple of solo projects which, uh, I mean, I have a solo album called Hold On, which is as good as anything I've ever done in my life. But then I'm, I'm faced with a different scene. I released that at the same time as Alanis Morissette releases Jagged Little Pill, and then record companies are all searching for the next, you know, female, young, young angry female. That's what record companies tend to do. They tend to follow only one leads one leads and then the others follow. So when Glass Tiger launched on Capitol, everybody was looking for the next Glass Tiger. You know, when Pearl Jam launched, everybody was looking for or Nirvana. Everybody was looking for the next Nirvana. So uh, uh, in in uh, in later years, uh, I I did a solo album, but everybody was looking for the next Alanis Morissette. So. Uh, um, my solo album, which I'm really proud of, if anybody wants to hear Hold On, it's pretty classic now. Uh, I do that. But then Glass Tiger is always being asked during all this time, would you come out and play? But a big hiatus goes on around the rest of the world, except Canada. So we, we continue to play all through these years. Uh, and so in uh, 2000 and whatever it was, uh, 15 we uh, I suffered a stroke in 2015 and it was our 30th anniversary so in 2016 I think it is we uh, we wanted to launch something but I just wasn't I just wasn't uh, healthy enough to think about tackling you know big big songwriting uh, schedules so uh we decided to take the classic songs that people had known and reimagine them. And we did what what I think is a beautiful rendition of, you know, Thin Red Line. I did a duet with Julian Lennon. Um, you know, uh, uh, Healing Hands, which is off of one of my solo albums. And we did it very kind of Cajun country style. Uh, Don't Forget Me When I'm Gone, my turn. We did Someday. Uh, we did someday more like a kind of gospel approach, and um, and I got my 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 mojo back and got back out playing live again. Got my strength up, and so last year we uh, we did an EP of new original music. Now you know you mentioned your stroke, and you know I've talked to like Tom Kiefer from Cinderella, who's lost his voice at times. Chris Barron from the Spin Doctors lost his voice for a year and a half. What is it like? I mean, the stroke is so scary, but what is it like for you? Because I had a bad health problem a year ago and it scares the shit out of you. But what is it like when you're a singer and stroke affects your speech and affects your side? What went through your head? I mean, what were you thinking? Well, uh, on the one hand, I was devastated because I was completely paralyzed on my right side. So my leg, and my right arm, I were non-functioning and uh, I could feel it behind my right ear but it, and I could feel it at the back of my tongue on the right side but it didn't come any further across my face so um, I was I had a, a, a slight droop uh, to my right eye and, and a little bit to my the corner of my mouth but um, I was able to speak uh, you know fairly fluently the way I am speaking to you today I had a bit of a stammer that came more from a, a memory thing like if you asked me a specific question I tended to st 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 stammer uh, as I was trying to find you the answer um, and then after about three or four days my fingers and my toes uh, began to wiggle um, and so they, they said to me that there was hope and that we just have to um, ride it out. And then I just got really aggressive and it was non-stop therapy for me. And as a matter of fact, when I left the hospital, instead of coming home, 
I moved into um, a rehab centre for uh, stroke rehab, and I, I, I stayed there for a couple of weeks until they got me up on a walker, and then I went every day, uh, other than the weekends, I think I took weekends off, I went every day as an outpatient, and I booked a gig, uh, I booked a gig in Toronto, and because because of my recognition and because of the high profile of the stroke, the gigs sold out, and, and uh, it was two nights in a, a place in Toronto called the Great Hall, and both nights sold out. But I was still, <laughs> I was still in a walker, and these nights were sold out nine months in advance, and I just, um, I just was relentless with uh, my therapy and, and getting back into the studio and singing. One, some days my, my assistant would fire up the microphone and I would literally get out of the chair and I'd maybe go, ah, and I'd have to sit down again and that'd be it. And he, he, he knew I, 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 I had no more to give you. And then, I, then it would be a sentence and then it would be a, a chorus and, uh, and it was shit and it was exhaustion. But it was every day, and uh, and then uh, uh, that was that. I, got out. I, I hit that stage. I had a panic attack. My neurologist was there in the dressing room with me, and uh, uh, and then I went out and I did it, and that was it. I was black. That's amazing. Now, I want to ask you, I, I know you go live on Facebook every once in a while, and I want you to tell my listeners, you told a story about Rod Stewart, and I think when your parents met Rod Stewart, or someone met Rod yeah. Stewart. Tell that story, because it was a really good story. Well, it's a classic story of my old dad, who, uh, my dad became like the the uh, patriarch of, of, of all the guys in the pub, either whoever's, Whoever had lost their fathers, maybe they died, or whoever the fathers were still over in the old country, more predominantly Scotland and England. And so my dad would hold court in the pub on a, on a Saturday and we'd all gather around him. And, you know, like he was everybody's dad. And uh, my mother <laughs> used to always, you know, if, if I tried to get my dad out to the pub, she would always nag us, no, you're not going to any pub, or she would come with us. <laughs> and so one Saturday, out of the blue, my mother said, why don't you get your dad ready and take him down the pub? And I'm thinking, wow, she's having a brain hemorrhage or something. What, <laughs> are you telling me that I can get my dad and the two of us can just go to the pub? And she goes, yeah. I said, are you coming? She said, no. I'm thinking, okay. So I say to my dad, you know, let's go. Let's go to the pub. And of course, my dad, who, who by the way, would have been 100 years old uh, two days ago, uh, if he was still with us. Uh, I said, get ready. So my dad was, uh, you know, I just wanted me to throw his coat on and go, but he's the old school. He has to wash and shave, <laughs> get a collar and tie on. And I'm saying, Dad, let's go. And uh, he said, oh, I'm, I'm coming, you know. So we go in the pub and all the boys gather around him. And I noticed that one of the guys was missing. And so I decide that I'm going to be a smart ass and I'm going to make a joke at my dad's expense in front of all these guys in the pub. So I said, hey, dad. And he said, what? I said, do you notice that there's someone conspicuously missing? And he says, hmm, who is it? And I said, it's George Morgan, who was a really good friend. And he was our neighbor. He was across the fence from us. And he said, oh, George, George is not here. I wonder where he is. And so I think I'm going to be a real smart aleck. And I said, well, I know where he is. Well, you're down here. He climbed the fence and he's in our house. <laughs> <laughs> he's smacking my mother. He's with my mother. He's with your wife. And all the boys kind of chuckle. Alan, they're being silly like that. They're all chuckling. And my dad looks at me and he goes, really? And I said, yes. He's with my mother. And my dad looks at his scotch. He's got a scotch on 
in his hand and he looks at the scotch and he looks up at the clock and he looks back at the scotch and he looks back up at the clock and then he says to his arm, I'll give him another hour. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he drinks his scotch. So I had told this story to Rod Stewart and uh, the big Rod and I had been hanging about for a, a while together in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, Rod was coming to Canada to perform at the Rogers Centre, which was more better known as the Sky Dome. And uh, I said to Rod, do us a favour, you're coming to Toronto to, to, to gig, let us be your opening act. And he said, OK. So we were we were uh, the opening act. <clears throat> and my brother was a huge Rod Stewart fan. And so I said to Rod, can you do me a favour, can I bring my bring my brother down, bring my family down to meet you. And he said, yeah, uh, after you come off and before I go on, bring them down to the dressing room. So I said, okay. So I, I go down to the dressing room and I say to my family, hang on a minute, I'll go on in and make sure he's, he's okay. So I go in and Rod is the only one in the dressing room. It was a beautiful moment in my life because he had a soccer ball and he was just keeping the soccer ball up. You know, he was, good, he was a good player. And, uh, you know, he would take the ball and he saw me in the dressing room. So he headed it over to me and I, you know, caught the ball in my chest and bring it down to my knees and I'm keeping the ball up and sending it back to him. And it was a beautiful moment. Like, I don't know who gets to do that, like spending two or three minutes with Rod Stewart, just the two of us keeping the ball up in the dressing room. And so I said to him, OK, I've got the family outside. And uh, uh, he said, brilliant, bring them in. So they come in. I introduced them to my girlfriend, who's now my wife. I introduced them to my my son at the time from uh, you know from my first marriage. I was a single parent, and then my brother, who was speechless, and you know here's my brother. And so finally, my my old dad was there, and Rod Stewart walks up to my dad and he goes, "Mr. Fru, Roderick Stewart," and he puts his hand out, and my dad goes, "Yeah, hello, son. Nice to meet you." And Rod Stewart says to my father, how's we George Morgan doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I burst out laughing because Rod had never forgotten that story about George Morgan climbing over the fence. My dad saying, I'll give him another hour. That was it. That's awesome, man. You know, Alan, I, I, I want to thank you for coming on. We went back and forth about trying to get you on, and it was such a pleasure talking to you. I'm sure you have a ton You're of welcome. stories. I know your website, you have... A section of people. He has a website, Alan Frew World, where you have road stories with Alan Frew. Yeah, I had a show called Road Stories. Uh, my website is alanfrewworld uh, dot com, and uh, I, I for those of you that you know you use your socials, I go on live on Facebook uh, usually every Tuesday, other than if, uh, when I'm traveling, and uh, you can you can catch the the follow. But it's called. Through F R E W, like through 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 the looking glass, and it's a little podcast that I've started. Uh, it's in its infancy. I, I've only done about three or four of them. I haven't had any guests on yet, but I will. And uh, uh, you can catch that on Spotify and on YouTube and stuff like that. Great. So people, go check it out. Go listen to his Google Soul album and go buy it. Go listen to Glass Tiger. Watch the video. Someday, you'll like that hat. I wanted to get a hat like that. I had hair back then. You know, it's the only thing. Do you know, I still have it. It's still in the house. I still have it. <laughs> who who picked out your clothes back then? Because you guys dress really good. I'm an 80s guy, so I dress like that, too. Well, who kicked you, you look know, good? Well, I've, I mean, uh, not to sound too egotistical, but, you know, fashion's always been a, uh, a thing I've enjoyed. So I was always... I was, and I'm sure the boys would back me up on this. I've, I've always been the one that had a fashion sense, and it rubbed off on them, and I would help them with it. And then, of course, you know, when you've got uh, a bit of a career on the go, you end up, you know, with the people doing videos, and you had like fashion designers coming on board and helping you do all that kind of shit, you know. Well, I want to thank you, people. So check out Alan Fruit. Check out Glass Tiger. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 775 episodes. Email me, cooper, at coopertalk.net. Twitter, I'm at coopertalk. Instagram, I'm at coopertalk1. So remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time. <laughs>